Due to the governor's declared state of emergency due to COVID-19, it is impractical and unsafe for the Board of Housing and Community Development to assemble in a single location. The board meeting um, will be held electronically today by video and telephone options pursuant to the Appropriation Act. The purpose of the meeting is to discuss and, and or transact the business statutory required or necessary to continue operations of the board and discharge the loss of purposes, duties, and responsibilities. Uh, the public is welcome to use the link and phone number that's been provided. The board will um, make available a recording and, and or transcript of the meeting in accordance with the time frames laid out in the Code of Virginia. Uh, votes today will be roll call votes. The meeting is being recorded. Um, please note if you need to use, there's a closed captioning feature. And uh, at the end of the meeting today, if you're interested in taking a survey on electronic meetings, I will put that in the chat. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kyle. Um, if you could please kindly call the roll of the full board. Mr. Abbasi. Present. Ms. Cotton. Present. Ms. Dewey. Susan. Ms. Dewey. Sorry, I was having technical difficulties, but I'm here. Good morning. Thank you. Mr. Farrell. Good morning, everybody. I'm present. Mr. Friedman. Uh, if, you could, if you could please mute your phone if you're not speaking. I appreciate it. We got some dog background noises. Yeah. Mr. Friedman. Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Mr. Gregory. Present. Ms. Halleck. Present. Mr. Jackson. Present. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Abby Johnson. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Keith Johnson. I'm here. Present. Ms. Monique Johnson. Present. Mr. Marinoff. Present. And Ms. Shields. Present. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, with that, we're going to open up for public comment um, at the outset of the meeting. Um, there will not be an opportunity for additional public comment later in the meeting or in the committee meetings. If you would like to indicate support of a previous speaker, you need to repeat their comments and may indicate simply that you support their statement. If you have not already indicated to Kyle that you wish to speak, please enter your name in the chat box. Uh, we will begin by calling on individuals who previously indicated they wish to speak. You must keep your comments under two minutes. Um, so I will probably give you about a 10 second warning um, and I'm going to return it to Kyle. Kyle, do you want to just indicate where the chat box is? It sounds like most people have found it, so. Is anybody not able to see the chat box or know where to go? All right, it looks like people are popping up over here. So, um, Kyle, I'll turn it over to you for the, for the public comment. And if we can get that clock that we had last time, that would be great. Or I'll use my phone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'll call the first person, and then I'll also call the, the next two so they can be ready. Uh, the first speaker is J.M. Snell, uh, followed by Dan Sandoval and Susan Stillman. J.L. J.M. Snell. Good morning. Thank you for uh, taking a few minutes to listen to me, and I'm quite privileged to go first. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is J.M. Snell. I'm a builder in the Shendo Valley. I've been a builder here for the past 25 years. I have some concerns of moving forward with the proposal RB313.1 to require sprinklers in all townhomes. To my knowledge, neither the work groups nor the board have examined the impact of this proposal would have on rural areas where water distribution systems and wells may not have enough water to supply a townhome fire sprinkler system. That case being 
a large pump or a tank might be necessary to store water on site for a townhome community. Additionally, unlike the Piedmont and the coastal regions of the state, our region of Virginia is very challenged with elevation variations. And so our fire flow is much harder to obtain and hold. We have large areas of our community that are planned and zoned already for townhome communities, medium density growth type areas, and getting that required fire flow might be a big light, uh, challenging deal. I'm also concerned about the availability of certified sprinkling contractors. I've worked with both uh, single family homes, uh, medium density type homes like townhomes. Uh, I also do apartments. So I've got experience working with uh, sprinkling contractors, and I know how much more challenging that makes a build. But nevertheless, the availability of them is the big deal. Might get a turn and more people get into that business, but it'll take a while. And I'm not sure we've taken that into account. Ten seconds. Completely understand the desire to increase safety of residential structures. But to do so without a public meeting or a discussion of the finer details of the haphazard and inevitably result in unintended consequences that the local governments will have to sort out. Respectfully ask that you reconsider and defer this proposal until the next code cycle. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next will be Dan Sandoval, followed by Susan Stillman and then Eric Gopleroud. Uh, Dan Sandoval. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Dan Sandoval and I'm a builder in the Fredericksburg area. And I'm here to comment on proposal RB313.1, which will require fire sprinklers in all new townhomes. I'm not here to debate the cost of the proposal or the need to do as much possible as much possible to protect individual families and their homes, but the very sensitive issue which directly impacts life, safety, housing affordability, local government infrastructure, the land planning process, and other areas which were not deliberated by the board, nor the work groups of technical experts. As shown by the progress made on energy efficiency and resiliency during the code cycle, the work group meetings are an effective means of bringing together stakeholders to evaluate each proposal and to work towards consensus. There are a lot of perspectives on residential fire sprinklers, and it's important that all the voices have a seat at the table before new code amendment of this significance is adopted. I would respectfully request the board <laughs> consider deferring this proposal until the next code cycle to allow a special work group comprised of industry, fire safety officials, and local governments to evaluate the proposal and make recommendations to the board on what, whether consensus can be found. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be <laughs> Susan, Susan Stillman, followed by Eric Gopplerud, and then Ivy Main. Uh, Susan Stillman. Hi, thank you. This is Susan Stillman. I'm in Vienna, Virginia, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the board today. Um, I believe that Virginians should be able to count on the Board of Housing and Community Development to have their interests at home, at heart. Homes that are well insulated and have very energy efficient windows are cheaper to operate, more comfortable and have fewer problems with pests. Virginia needs to adopt the current IECC standards for wall and attic insulation and windows. It's expensive and disruptive to upgrade wall insulation and windows later on. In fact, Virginia needs to adopt the full IECC. Um, there's been no dispute about the um, use utility of this and that greater energy efficiency makes those homes cheaper to operate over their life. And that life of a home is 70 or more years. So it's not just about first cost, it's about what it costs to operate a home and for the duration of the um, home's life and for all the residents in the Commonwealth that have to live in that home. We also know what's wrong to claim that builders can get to by fours for framing homes. It's not borne out by fact, and we know that in Maryland it's required, and homes sell in the same price range. Builders can choose to use two by six studs <laughs> with R20 insulation, and they have other choices. Um, due to the limited time here, I won't get into all that, but there are choices and ways to um, achieve that energy efficiency. So I hope that Virginia will adopt the um, full IECC. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Eric Gottlerud, followed by Ivy Main, and then Craig Tolson. Eric. Good, good morning. I'm Eric Gottlerud, board chair of the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, a nonpartisan interfaith organization of more than 80 faith communities and 2,400 faith-based activists in Northern Virginia. We recommend the adoption of the 2018 IECC without exception for new residential construction. Facts about the impact of building energy efficiency standards have been made and will be made by others. As a leader of an interfaith organization, I must talk about the morality of the decisions you will make. All our diverse faiths are called to love God and our neighbors. These are fundamental pr principles. Our climate is becoming less stable. Our neighbors are suffering. Many of these changes are harmful. They can damage our health, destabilize our communities, and burden our budgets. They are especially harmful for low-income families, to some communities of color, to those living on disabilities, and to those who are particularly vulnerable, such as children and elderly. We have a responsibility to be good stewards and to make moral choices for the good of all creation in order to bring about a more just society. Jacqueline DuPont Walker, chair of the Social Action Committee of the African Methodist Episcopal Church said, quote, if we're not willing to lead on climate change, then we are not willing to lead a world that is the best for our children. Pope Francis in Laudato Si said, living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not an optional or secondary aspect of our Christian experience. In his encyclical letter, Care for Our Common Home, Pope Francis makes it clear that failing to be a good and loving steward of creation is a sin, a sin that offends God and harms ourselves and our neighbors. 10 seconds. We know, yes, we know that future generations will be impacted by your actions or inactions today. We recommend adoption of the 2018 IECC. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Ivy Main, followed by Craig Tolson, and then William Penniman. Ivy Main. Hi, I've, uh, yes, I'm Ivy Main. I'm an energy policy expert and writer of the blog, powerforthepeopleva.com. I also want to encourage the board to adopt the full 2018 IECC as, as a better result for home buyers and tenants. The modest extra cost to meet the higher standard is recouped by energy savings in a few years' time. Meanwhile, those efficiency measures deliver protection for residents' health, safety, and welfare for the full life of the building, which, as Susan Stillman said, could be 70 years or more. Maryland does it, so can Virginia. Moreover, upfront affordability is just one factor in health, safety, welfare, and energy conservation. The board has to consider the full life cycle of the building, a healthier and more comfortable home to live in, and one that saves on energy costs, delivers benefits to residents for the life of the dwelling, minimizing occupancy costs to residents throughout the entire occupancy period. In spite of this, we heard builders and others cite affordability as a reason not to adopt some proposals. Uh, what they really mean by affordability is upfront cost. But while builders say they are concerned about keeping prices low for buyers, their actual concern is with maximizing their own profits by keeping building costs as low as possible. How much a house sells for is determined by what a buyer will agree to pay, not by what it costs a builder to put it up. It's economics 101, and it's a principle everyone knows who has put money into a home renovation and then not gotten that money back when selling the house. Builders know this very well. If they figure a certain kind of house in a certain area can sell for a certain price, Every penny they save by using less insulation is profit. That doesn't mean more efficient buildings necessarily lead to thinner profits. It means builders have to do a better job promoting efficiency as a selling point in their homes. Again, Maryland builders seem to have figured this out. They can meet the full ICC standards and sell houses in the same price range as Virginia builders. Our builders are presumably as talented as Maryland builders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Craig Tolson, followed by William Penniman and Judy Geyer. Craig Tolson. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Craig Tolson. I represent the building industry in Virginia, not just home builders, but also their suppliers, trade contractors, and lastly, future home buyers. 
Since 2015, the market for new townhomes in Virginia has almost doubled. It's a major sector of the housing market in order to supply quality, affordable housing to Virginians. As you can tell from the list of proposals being adopted today, the 2018 code process has led to better energy efficiency, air quality, resiliency, and electrical codes. This progress is linked to the extensive communication occurred to stakeholders in the work group meetings. I'm speaking today in opposition of proposal RB313.1-18 that requires mandatory fire sprinklers in townhomes. It did not receive discussion or vetting in a work group meeting. Why? Because the proposed proponent did not show up. Because of this, it moved forward non-consensus non at your October meeting. At the end of that six hour meeting, it was discussed for five minutes and action was taken. There was no public comment, no stakeholder input, no vetting to understand the true impacts of this decision. Here are some facts. Only eight states in the nation require sprinklers in townhomes. The only bordering state is Maryland. We are not Maryland, we are Virginia. Fire sprinklers are offered to buyers as an option at total cost price. That includes permit fees, development fees, contractor fees, and water connection fees. We estimate that cost could be a maximum $15,000 a townhome. Have all stakeholders been included? Very rarely is this board adopted a code provision with this magnitude without first getting all the work group together of technical ex experts. 10 seconds. We ask that you defer this we were, and for the proposal of final regulations and establish a work group for the next code cycle. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be William Penniman and then Judy Geyer, and then Joy Loving. William Penman. Good morning. Uh, my name is William Penniman. Um, I am was an active participant in submitting proposals to the through the work group process to the board, and. Uh, represent the Virginia chapter of the Sierra Club in my comments today. Um, as outlined in the supplemental comments we submitted to you last week, and I assume you received and had an opportunity to read, uh, we urge the Board of Housing Community Development to make the Virginia building code consistent with the energy conservation standards in the 2018 IECC. By law, the Board of Housing Community Development may minimize costs to builders but only to the extent the, that Virginia's building code is consistent with recognized standards, including for energy conservation from the ICC. The, beyond that, the duty is to protect the health, safety, and welfare of residents of Virginia. The recommendations from the Codes and Standards Committee violate those standards um, because they are plainly not consistent with recognized standards, including the IECC. Uh, work groups are useful, but they can be uh, disastrous if, they, if their assignment extends beyond how to comply with the international code in a more efficient manner and extends to the power to block compliance with the IECC. And unfortunately in Virginia, that's been the case. As a result, Virginia residents will suffer uh, higher costs and less affordable dwellings for the next 70 years. To bring this into compliance, you should adopt all the provisions, including for wall insulation, uh, fenestration, and tighter air seals, which are broadly recognized as necessary to protecting uh, residents from uh, higher energy costs, mold, rot, humidity, and pests. Um, Virginia is just behind EPA and everyone else on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Judy Geyer, and then Joy Loving, and then Glenn Dean. Judy Geyer. Thanks. My name is Judy Geyer. I'm a resident of McLean, Virginia. Thanks for allowing me to speak. The construction industry is a major contributor to the climate disaster we're facing. Buildings account for almost 40% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Requiring construction to adhere to recognized efficiency standards is the very least we need to do in this sector to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Virginians. 
particularly because in this sector, our activities today have an impact that lasts for decades. Protecting the environment always involves an upfront investment with benefits running into the future. Our past unwillingness to make that investment is exactly what's led us to the situation we now face. I was disappointed to learn that the board so far appears to have decided to allow the building code to remain behind the times in terms of energy efficiency. Granted, builders oppose being required to meet recognized energy efficiency standards because it costs them money, just a little bit of money. However, builders can get back their added costs in the purchase price, and the cost is so small that building occupants will recoup any added price quickly through lower utility bills. Just a few miles away from us, Maryland requires builders to fully comply with the most recent IECC and has for years. And it appears that these very same builders and their customers are able to thrive in Maryland, notwithstanding the fact that they're required to comply with energy efficiency standards that this board has to date refused to impose in Virginia. The small added cost has not caused problems for any participants in the Maryland real estate market. It's time for Virginia to catch up. Despite builder objections, by law, the building code must change to reflect the most current recognized standards, not standards from a decade ago. Section 3699 of the Virginia Code says that building provi code provisions, quote, shall be such as to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of the Commonwealth. Ten shall seconds. means must, it's mandatory. By contrast, the code says that the board should allow for lower construction using a non-mandatory term and qualifies even the non-mandatory statement by saying this should be done only if it is consistent with recognized health, safety, and resource conservation standards. Time. The exceptions to the IECC that are still reflected in the current building code do not miss, meet that consistency with recognized standards test. I hope this board will heed the testimony Time, provided by so many citizens and citizens groups and bring the Virginia building code fully in line with currently recognized standards by adopting the full IECC and eliminating any exceptions. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be uh, me, Joy Loving, followed by Glenn Dean, and then Elizabeth Greenfield. Joy Loving. Good morning. Today I'm representing the Climate Action Alliance of the Valley, speaking to you from Grottoes, Virginia. Uh, we are in the central Shenandoah Valley. We endorse uh, Mr. Peniman's letter to you of December 10th and the recommendations and arguments and testimony that he referred to in that letter. We especially call your attention to the portion of the letter titled Other Issues and reiterate our agreement with the proposal describing EV readiness, the recommendations for its adoption and the basis for that recommendation. The EV market is growing dramatically and will continue to do so as we migrate to greater use of electricity to meet our transportation and other needs. Virginia has set a high bar for carbon reduction in its 2020 Clean Economy Act, and all Virginians need to do their part in achieving the Commonwealth's goals. However, the Virginia Clean Economy Act provisions will not result in Virginia's achieving those goals, according to Energy Innovation's December 2020 report, which shows that although the VCEA provisions will cut statewide emissions 26%, additional policies are needed to meet the goals. The building industry and the board can't really exempt themselves from doing their part. And I'm confident, and so is Climate Action Alliance of the Valley, that the talented, creative, and competent people part of this industry can meet this obligation. None of my three adult children lives in an EV-ready house or apartment. The retrofitting needed just for their types of residents and speaks volumes about the imperative of not continuing building practices that don't anticipate future needs of building occupants or those of the environmental goals we've set. Ten seconds, CAV yeah. strongly urges the board to meet its statutory obligations and adopt the IECC standards. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Glenn Dean followed by Elizabeth Greenfield and then Ross Shearer. Glenn Dean. Good morning, this is Glenn Dean. I'm the original proponent of RB 313.1. And while I was involved in the work group process, uh, it is true I missed the October meeting, the reason for which I, I truly don't remember. But coming out of that, you know, in modified form, RB 313.1, 
I do support it. I think that is a very, very bold and important step that the Codes of Standard Committee took and I thank them and in advance, I thank the board. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Elizabeth Greenfield and then Ross Shearer and then David Radford. Elizabeth Greenfield. Thank you. Good morning, um, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. My name is Elizabeth Greenfield. I'm representing the Home Building Association of Richmond. Um, I'm here to speak against proposal RB313.1 for many of the reasons um, already outlined by previous speakers. Um, we are concerned that the, the speed that this proposal moved forward and, and not going through the work group um, process. Um, in the Richmond region, um, the townhome market is growing and it's growing rapidly. It's an important part of the industry's response to growing demand for walkable communities and affordable price point strategies to promote um, denser development in some areas to reduce demand on infrastructure and increased um, housing options around excuse me transit and job centers um, as one of the speakers uh, previously mentioned um, we have a lot of growth in the townhouse market already planned and zoned for and I'm concerned at how this proposal would impact that market so I would respectfully request that the board defer and reconsider this proposal to allow more opportunity for stakeholder engagement Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Ross Shearer, followed by David Radford and Soledad Portilla. Uh, Ross Shearer. Hi, I am Ross Shearer in Vienna speaking on my own behalf. I want to refocus your attention on the wall insulation proposal RE402.1.2 parent six to adopt the ICC model's R20 standard by removing the current codes weakening amendments. You may recall that on October 19th, the Codes and Standards Committee defeated this by one vote. I ask that you reconsider this valuable proposal by putting yourselves for a moment in the role of an investment advisor. The costs of this proposal are typically recovered in less than six years. I want to know where I can double my money that fast because that's much better rate of return with lower risk than uh, the stock markets. I would suggest the impartiality of a financial advisor who would fail to bring such an investment to my attention. With an apology to Mr. Gregory for predictions that I'm going to make, houses built are 70, today are 75 years old in 2095, more than 45 years after the year when global temperatures will have passed the 1.5 degrees centigrade rise. Any building that is not made compatible with that future's requirements for an all electric near zero carbon economy will be obsolete and unusable. The board should embrace the vision today for what the future clearly requires that the R20 wall insulation standard for today's new homes be adopted to thus avoid rendering them prematurely obsolete I offer my thanks to the five members who proposed, spoke, and voted at the October 19th meeting for adoption of the R20 wall, R20 wall insula insulation standard. With emphasis on affordable, I ask that members engaged in affordable housing businesses and have voted to defeat the standard, causing it to rain at R13, reconsider their opposition in light of this code's proposals, strong investment potential. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be David Radford, <clears throat> Soledad Portilla, and then Patrick McCarthy. David Radford. Uh, thank you, and, and uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is David Radford. I'm a builder uh, in Runnock County in the town of Christiansburg. I'm concerned about the fire sprinkler proposal being advanced without an accurate representation of the impact it would have around the Commonwealth for both local governments and the building industry. Also, as chairman of the Roanoke County Board of Supervisors, I'm accustomed to implementing laws and regulations that have been adopted in Richmond without consideration given to the vast differences between our localities. Virtually all the information provided to the board by the supporters is based on estimates and data from Northern Virginia. 
where the economic realities are drastically different than what we have here in Southwest Virginia. I've had many discussions with my fire chief about sprinklers for single family homes and townhomes. And to implement this proposal, many localities would have to add additional fire marshals to conduct yearly inspections of those systems. Additionally, townhomes sprinklers may not be much of a strain on the local water infrastructure and local water utilities in urban and suburban areas, but they're, they uh, could present significant challenges uh, in the rural areas. If a work group had discussed this proposal with a broader group of stakeholders, it would have been good to bring in local governments and water utilities at the table. As a builder, I'm concerned about the lack of discussion regarding the actual implementation of this proposal. For example, uh, in a town home, would you need a designated area for control valves and fire, uh, the fire pump, and also annual inspections, uh, the cost of that and the requirements. Thank you. Uh, in closing, I urge the board to measure twice and cut once on this proposal. This is a significant decision for our industry and our communities should not be made, should not be made without minimal discussion by the impacted stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up will be Soledad Portilla, followed by Patrick McCarthy and Tom Schuldel. Uh, Soledad Portilla. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Soledad Portilla, a home builder in Northern Virginia. We build townhomes primarily in the Northern Virginia market. I wanted to thank you for allowing me to address the board today to express my concerns over the proposal RB313.1 that will require sprinkler systems in all townhomes. The townhome market in Virginia, and in Northern Virginia especially, is the market for first-time home buyers. Home ownership is a pillar of the American dream, but unfortunately, many of those in younger generations cannot afford to pursue it. Adding even $1,000 to the cost of a home will keep many buyers from being able to qualify. The 2018 building code will already add over $5,000 to the upfront price of every home adding thousands of dollars to the home of someone first home warrants much more discussion and vetting than what has taken place with RB313.1. As a home builder and land developer, I pay careful attention to housing trends in other states. My company prides itself on forward-thinking planning and design to deliver the most quality product and an affordable price to all of our customers. Since 2009, only two states, Maryland and California, have adopted fire sprinkler systems in homes, and only six have added to the mandate to townhomes. That means that other 42 states do not mandate requirements for sprinkler homes in homes. In eight states that do not mandate these requirements, I know that was, it was thoroughly vetted and discussed by all stakeholders. The proposal that came before you at your last exactly. meeting did not receive stakeholder input at the work group meetings and the proponent did not even show. I am asking you to please defer adding RB313.1 into the final 2002 Virginia Uniform Statewide Building Code to allow for a thorough vetting and discussion. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next, we'll have Patrick McCarthy, followed by Tom Schrodel and then Bob Shippey. Patrick McCarthy, I believe you're on the phone. Can you hear us? I can. Hello, uh, my name is Patrick McCarthy. I'm a builder in the greater Richmond region. I've uh, developed roughly 600 townhomes over the last three years in Central Virginia. Harvard University recently released their annual State of the Nation's House Report which included an analysis of various factors that impact the ability of nonprofit and private builders to supply the types of well-located housing to low and moderate income families. The report states, as I quote, while land use restrictions and building codes are essential to public health and safety, it is critical to balance those goals against the unmet need for smaller, denser housing that is convenient to transportation and employment opportunities. 
Over the last 10 years, townhome construction has been a growing component of Virginia's new housing stock and of local government strategy to increase the supply of affordable rental and for sale housing opportunities. The long-term prospects of townhome construction are positive given the large number of home buyers looking for medium density, walkable residential communities with lower maintenance costs at a affordable price point. The proposal for sprinklers will impact the ability for townhomes to be an important part of the affordable housing stock. Some supporters of the change have estimated the cost will range from two to $5,000 in Northern Virginia. There are others in the Richmond region who estimate around $12,000. And that has been one of the discussion points that has bothered me. There's probably some truth in both numbers, but not enough work has been done to figure out the real impact. In closing, I hope the board will pursue a similar path to what other states with sprinkler requirements have done. Deliberately review and evaluate every aspect of the proposal to see if consensus can be found. In the often cited example of Maryland, the state legislator discussed the issue at length before enacting the requirement in 1989. During this cycle, the requirement to sprinkler townhomes received no more than a couple Time, of minutes sir. of discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Tom Schrodel, followed by Bob Shippey and John Olivieri. Uh, Tom Schrodel. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Tom Schrodel and I'm the president of Atlantic Builders. Our building company primarily builds in the Charlottesville and Fredericksburg markets. I'm speaking today in opposition to RB313.1 that would require mandatory fire sprinkler systems in townhomes. My company builds the best homes possible and creates extraordinary relationships with our customers. We do that through our passion, dependability, and dedication to excellence. As members of the Board of Housing, I know that you are also dedicated to excellence for the citizens of Virginia. Excellence is achieved by committing to a dependable process. Unfortunately, the process will fail us at Proposal RB313.1 that would require mandatory fire sprinkler systems in townhomes is approved to move forward. This proposal was only discussed for five minutes with no public or stakeholder input. This proposal is a big deal and deserves more. If passed, it will significantly change not only how we build and design communities, but also who is able to buy homes in Virginia and in the future. It also sets a bad precedent for the code development process in Virginia, a process that at one time was recognized as the gold standard of building code development processes in the country. So please defer proposal RB313.1 to allow more discussion to make sure that you have every factual answer on the effects before making such a major decision for the citizens of Virginia. I know that this board will achieve excellence if the process is followed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be Bob Shippey, uh, John Olivieri, and Chris Mari. Uh, Bob Shippey. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, my name is Bob Shippey. I'm a resident of Henrico County, um, and I appreciate the job you have to do. It's difficult. Uh, you're under a lot of time pressure in trying to make your decisions, and uh, so you're reliant on things like outputs from the working groups and, and others that are presenting recommendations to you. Uh, I, I get that. I've been part of many stakeholder groups myself, and some are successful in, in pulling together all the inputs uh, to, to give a, a strong recommendation, others have not been. Um, in this case, um, clearly the output uh, represents a failure to, to meet the law um, and, the, and the Commonwealth's energy policy. Um, I would encourage you to adopt the full IECC standards from 2018. Again, we're about to, to uh, enter 2021 uh, here, and uh, I, I think it's um, uh, a, a very poor um, idea to, to not at least adopt the 2018 standards. And, and I think that there's been a lot of talk about upfront costs and, and those are not um, to be ignored. Um, but again, buildings have a long life and uh, I, I think a couple of percent on the front end uh, for a tremendous return over the 70 plus year life of a building is a very smart decision. And so we need to keep the big picture in mind as others have mentioned. So uh, there's a lot in the code that says uh, you need to watch out for health and welfare of residents. And, and there's a tremendous amount in the IECC standards like the uh, the air sealing uh, standards at three ACH and others that 
uh, really watch out for that. And so uh, I would encourage you to adopt the full IECC standards from 2018. And I appreciate your time with this. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be John Olivieri, Chris Mari, and David Hutchinson. John Olivieri. Hi. Uh, hello, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is John Oliveri, and I'm president of Fourth Generation Home Builders. I'm a um, home builder uh, and developer out of Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm speaking today in opposition to RB313.1 that would require the mandatory fire sprinkler systems in townhomes. I've built over a thousand townhomes in the past 30 years, and I'm not aware of one that has ever had a catastrophic fire damage. This is due to the fact that modern building codes today, which require two hour firewalls, fire blocking, draft stopping, smoke and CO2 detectors, fire extinguishers, and many other fire safety measures have been able to greatly reduce the risk of residential fires and new construction. We also undergo extensive ex inspections from the building inspectors for these firewalls and other fire code related requirements. My experience with fire sprinklers in townhomes is that they cost easily five to $7,000 per townhome, and I haven't done any in probably three or four years, so I'm sure that cost has gone up. Um, it's also just the cost, not just the cost of the sprinkler system itself, but you have to have separate fire alarm system, monitoring, possibly a separate water meter and water line for the sprinkler system. And that's for your, you know, residential NFPA 13D systems. Some localities uh, will require the NFPA 13R system, which is even more expensive and complicated to install and maintain. Those systems also require a separate control room with a flow control valve, the flow control valve and alarm systems have to be monitored with two separate phone lines or a cell phone monitor. They have to be inspected annually, which usually costs about $50 to $100 per inspection. And then you have to have a licensed sprinkler contractor with you when you do the inspection. And that's another two or $300. I could go on and on, but I think everybody gets the picture. Um, I'm currently in review, uh, a site plan review for a 15 unit townhome project in Chesapeake, Virginia. If this proposal is passed, I have no idea how it's going to affect my project, whether I'm going to have to, you know, put in larger water lines or less fire sprinklers or, you know, anything to address these issues. There's just it's a lot to be considered. Um, I don't think this has been vetted properly. And I would urge um, I would urge the board to put this to a work group so that we can look at, you know, the possible implementations of it and all of the effects that that's going to have. Um, obviously, I can you know talk like everyone else. If only eight Hi, states sir. in the nation have adopted it, I think we need to revisit this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris Mari, David Hutchinson, and then Robbie Dawson. Uh, Chris Mari. Hey, <clears throat> good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is Chris Mori, and I'm a builder here in Lynchburg with Long Meadows Incorporated. Uh, I develop and build single family homes as well as townhome neighborhoods. So I'm very familiar with uh, the issues involved. I don't envy you the, the position you guys are in on evaluating the proposal like RB 313.1 um, requiring fire sprinklers in new townhomes. But um, along with safety, we got to have a balance and uh, you have life safety, but you have your financial health as well. Uh, the cost burden on the uh, lower and middle income families is pretty great in our area here in Lynchburg. Um, right now, 46.5% uh, of the renters and uh, in the Lynchburg area are very cost burden, meaning that they pay more than 30% of their income for housing. Uh, this is not financially healthy. And in our area, one size does not fit all. I mean, it's true of everywhere, but uh, there's a better way to go about things, and we want to bring more stakeholders in, not to reuse a term that everybody uh, uses here, but it's true. Um, in the past, we've come along with uh, shaft liner and uh, the two-hour party wall system. It's, it's a very good and tried and true system that we've used for decades. Um, in Lynchburg, most of your city and county departments are typically located within five minutes of the vast majority of the townhome communities. So this obviously uh, helps minimizing fire destruction. Arc faults in the bedrooms, the electrical code addressed that as well. The bottom line is, uh, like Craig Tolson said earlier, we need to bring more stakeholders to the table. One size does not fit all. Uh, every area has different needs and requirements. So uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be David Hutchinson, Hutchison, followed by Robbie Dawson, and then Andrew Milliken. 
uh, David Hutchison. David Hutchison. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Hutchison. I'm the fire chief here in Virginia Beach and uh, the state chief's president for this year. I just like to thank the board for uh, supporting the residential sprinklers in the townhomes. Um, as you know, I could give you anecdotal stories uh, to offset many of what the, some of the builders have said here. One of them, quite frankly, is that in uh, one of my largest townhome fires has been in Chesapeake, where we displaced, I think, like 67 residents. So uh, they do get become large fires, which is very concerning to us. They're complex. Uh, their operations, when you're, you're hampered because of access, it's not like just a large open dwelling. There's multiple pockets with the different housing and all that, which stretches our resources thin. The fires then lead into the attic, which uh, cause more issues. So we have, uh, we, it's, it's a concerning, concerning for us all the way around. It has just a detrimental impact to our firefighters, as well as, I, I mean, again, I could tell you many times of, you know, children, elderly, elderly and everything in between as far as losing their lives on these type of fires. Um, so just in closing, I just think it would be, uh, I'd ask for your continued support on this and staying on the right side of history. And also on behalf of your fire chiefs across this Commonwealth, we appreciate everything you're doing here. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be Robbie Dawson, followed by Andrew Milliken and then Jeff Shapiro. Robbie Dawson. Good morning. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, I wanted to uh, introduce myself as a, in a Robbie Dawson with the National Fire Protection Association. And I want to briefly highlight uh, one point that I know some supplemental information has been provided to the board. Um, since your October meeting, there have been a couple of questions that have come up regarding customer demand for residential sprinklers. And I want to just point out a couple of notes uh, from that information you were given in regards to uh, a home fire sprinkler coalition that NFPA is a partner with, uh, a, a survey that was conducted of uh, prospective home buyers that was done in 2005 and then again in 2014. And not to belabor the details of it, but just to point out that th those surveys clearly demonstrated that there is consumer interest and demand for residential sprinklers uh, in, the, in, the, in the market. Uh, just a note that survey was conducted again this year. Those those results have not yet been published uh, publicly, but I will share with you that uh, the data uh, is co very consistent with what was published in the uh, 25th, uh, the 2014 study, uh, with one minor exception, and that is that fire safety is very important to the homeowner. The 2014 uh, survey indicated that there was a 59% a positive rate for that. That number has jumped to over 80% uh, in the 2020 survey, as well as some other in interesting information about the uh, generational uh, interest demand. So as that study becomes public, uh, I'm sure we will share that with the board if it's if it uh, happens before the implementation of this code. Uh, lastly, I'd like to just uh, also echo my uh, thanks to the Virginia's board, the Virginia Housing Board. I know the, the workload that goes into the background that uh, is involved with um, updating all the codes and applaud you and I uh, thank you for um, bringing our codes in line with what our neighbors in, in, Nor in Maryland have seen since 1992 and that's residential sprinklers and townhomes. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Wow, right on the nose, two minutes. Nice walk. Thank you. Uh, next will be Andrew Milliken followed by Jeff Shapiro and then David Bean. Andrew Milliken. Good morning, my name is Andrew Milliken. I'm the chairman of the Virginia Fire Services Board Codes and Standards Committee. I want to, to express my thankfulness to this board for the willingness to genuinely weigh the merits of every code change brought to you this development cycle and to move Virginia forward. This is particularly true of your decision to include fire sprinklers as an essential fire safety system in townhomes. It's a decision that has been proven in practice all over the country for years and one that we will know will save Virginian lives and properties for decades to come. As you know, a family living in a townhouse may have no idea what's going on in the unit next door. Townhouse neighbors might have unsafe cooking practices, reckless smoking habits, store hazardous materials, like to weld, or could even be operating a drug lab. Even if occupants know what's going on next door, they have no control over it. What your neighbor does, regardless of whether it affects your safety, is his or her business. The only thing standing between your home burning down and their home burning down is one wall. 
If you and your family are asleep, your townhouse neighbors' smoke alarms will not activate yours, so your egress will be delayed. What if you have to rescue kids or someone in, uh, inside is in a wheelchair or is elderly? Or maybe your pets and kids alone uh, are alone with or with a babysitter. Your neighbor's bad or wreck careless behavior puts your family at risk. This board's choice to include the active fire safety systems already required by the National Building Codes to reduce that risk is to be commended. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be Jeff Shapiro, followed by David Beam and James Demmel. Jeff Shapiro. My name is Jeff Shapiro, and I'm a fire protection engineer serving as executive director of the IRC Fire Sprinkler Coalition and as a consultant to NFSA. I submitted a proposal to the Virginia Code to require sprinklers in some dwellings that are more than three stories tall. We had extensive discussion in the work groups and beyond with the home building industry and other stakeholders on that proposal and unfortunately could not reach consensus. We've been discussing residential sprinklers in Virginia for years and it's fair to say that waiting another cycle isn't going to bring consensus on this topic. It's too controversial. I would like the board to know my concern for my proposal has been more thoroughly addressed by your decision to adopt the IRC requirement for sprinklers and townhouses, and I fully support that decision. I also want to mention that my proposal included financial and design incentives that I would like to see Virginia adopt in the future as they would benefit home buyers and home builders. I would also like to address the concerns raised regarding affordable housing in Virginia. 20 years ago, I personally began to work with Habitat for Humanity in Austin, Texas, where I live provide fire sprinklers in new habitat homes. Since that time, Austin Habitat has installed fire sprinklers in over 200 homes that were constructed. While these were single family homes, it clearly shows that we can build entry level housing, which is often provided by townhouses, that is both safe and affordable with fire sprinklers. Also, you heard comments about the adequacy of rural water supplies for townhouse sprinklers. I can say as a fire protection engineer, if you have enough water to meet the IRC plumbing requirements, you typically have enough water for a fire sprinkler system for a, a, a dwelling unit. And if you don't have enough water for fire sprinklers, you certainly do not have enough water for the fire department to put out a fire. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to address these uh, points and concerns with you. And thank you to the board for taking this important step to providing safe housing for Virginia's future townhouse residents. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be David Beam, followed by James Demmel and uh, and Tony Fleming. David Beam. Thank you, Kyle. Um, thank you to the uh, board for taking the time to do the uh, arduous job here today. I also want to thank uh, DHCD for their staff members that have participated throughout the last three years to get to the point where we're at, as well as the um, stakeholders that have participated throughout the entire process. Uh, with that being said, I'm in opposition to the RB313 uh, for the simple fact that this has gone through the code change proposal process and has not come out at a uh, satisfactory level at this point in time. While the board can overturn that, and I have no problem with that, that is the board's decision. I do find it very, very disheartening though that the information that was brought in during the last meeting uh, found its way through as a positive vote with two abstentions to the vote. So there's obviously some uh, concern there of not, not lack of knowledge of what's going on or things of that nature. But there were also a number of questions that were raised by members uh, to clarify what was actually being proposed. I believe that, it is, that clarification is here today, but again, this is something that the co hearings, the, the code development process is to evaluate and go through. If members at this point in time don't have a working knowledge of the full impact of this, I would suggest that this be turned down and worked out through the process as it should have been to begin with. Thank you very good time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Next will be James Demmel by Tony Fleming and then Andrew Grigsby. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is James Demo. I'm an elevator constructor in Alexandria, Virginia. I would like to, to drop my support or submit my support for previously submitted comments by Scott Holstrom. They're uh, quite a bit 
lengthy comments and a little more than I can give you in two minutes. But again, I would like to support the comments dropped earlier by Scott Holtzman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be Tony Fleming, followed by Andrew Grigsby, and then Robert Glass. Uh, Tony Fleming. Hello, Chairman and Committee members. My name is Tony Fleming, and I'm a fire sprinkler contractor that serves the Mid-Atlantic region. We specialize in residential fire sprinklers. First off, I'd like to thank you for your already supportive vote in favor of RB313. I wanted to take some time to discuss the pricing of these systems because no matter when or where, it seems that pricing is always a factor. I was involved in a 2008 NFPA national study where we determined that the national average to install sprinklers was $1.61 per square foot. In 2013, we again recreated this study, and the pricing had now come down to $1.35 per square foot. In 2011, Pennsylvania passed a multifamily ordinance for residential sprinklers. And just like now, we heard outlandish pricing uh, being discussed, just like the gentleman who previously stated that it would cost around $15,000 per townhouse. We currently do installations in Pennsylvania for well under $1.25 per square foot, thus making the cost of, for an average sprinkler system in the townhouse come in at around $1,500 which goes in line with what it calls for a sprinkler system in Maryland, which is well below the national average. We have been doing residential work in Virginia for well over 15 years. Several years ago, uh, we were just one of several sprinkler contracts that were involved in a community in Stafford County called uh, Celebrate, which has over a thousand sprinkler town, uh, excuse me, over a thousand sprinkler houses. The highest price model in this community that we did came in at $1.33 per square foot. We were not awarded work by several other builders in this community because our pricing was too high. So let me understand this. We're at $1.33 per square foot and we're too high, but yet everyone's saying these prices seem to be way out there. So like I said, I think everything can be done competitive and the price will only go down from there. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for more people to get involved, plumbers and everything else, which could help drive this cost down. But we're already below the national average. Thank seconds. you for your time. I'd be happy to answer, answer any questions regarding pricing or installation. Thank you. And, and next up, we have Linda Hale. I believe she had shown up as uh, unknown in the chat. And I'm sorry if I skipped you. So Linda Hale will be next, followed by Andrew Grigsby and then Robert Glass. Uh, Linda Hale. Ms. Hale. Ms. Um, Hale. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and, and circle up before we close out the comment. So next we'll move to Andrew Grigsby. Good morning, thank you. My name is Andrew Grigsby. I'm representing myself. I live in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Mr. Penniman and Ms. Geyer, I think, raised important points about the legal duty of this board concerning due regard for national standards. And perhaps it may be wise to delay approval of the new code until the board's council has offered an opinion on this. Again, the BHCD is statutorily bound to be consistent with and to give due regard for national standards such as the IECC. Please seek counsel's advice on this. I'll further alert you to the standards of the 2021 IECC, which is coming out in within weeks. For this climate zone, wall insulation will go up with the new standard, as will attic insulation. This means that the current proposed 2018 USBC will have us falling either farther behind, especially on wall insulation, which as has been stated many times, is the most costly element to retrofit in the future. And as Mr. Shearer so eloquently put it, you have the power <coughs> to give Virginians a fantastic investment rather than a, a dud of wall insulation that's out of step with the times. The 2021 IECC also keeps whole house air leakage at three air changes per hour, as it has since 2012. 
that threshold has now passed muster in the, at the national level three times. It's not based on speculation. It's based on proven science. I submit that Virginia's process has not been sufficient to overturn the exhaustive process held by thousands of participants at the national level, which now four times has stated that three air changes per hour in this climate zone is appropriate. The, um, I know you've had lots of votes on this already. I'll just say that it's never too late to do the right th thing. Please take steps to adopt the full 2018 IECC without modification. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we have Linda Hale back on the phone, so we will try Linda Hale. How about now? Are we able to hear a bit better now? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. My name is Linda Hale. I'm the Chief Fire Marshal here in Loudoun County. Um, we, have, we are an urban to rural community that, are 500, that is 521 square miles. We're 1,900 feet above sea level, and we're along the crest of the Blue Ridge. We have a little bit of everything here. Um, from a population of 426,000, we're the largest fourth largest county in Virginia. We have a 24% foreign-born population. So we go from very rural to very urban. We have used incentives to be able to work with builders and communities to be able to help townhome communities from firewall separation reduction to road width reduction to rural water elimination. Um, unfortunately, I look a little haggard this morning because I was out the well after 2 a.m. Um, on a townhouse fire last night. We had a fatality, 58-year-old female. Um, and unfortunately, the townhouse was not sprinklered. Um, we did have a neighbor that was able to break a window and for the most part extinguish the fire with a garden hose, but not before we had a fatality. So I will leave that to you as to determine whether or not a, fresh, a sprinkler system as um, minimalistic as a 13R, 13D would have um, done that last night. So I want to thank you for your work. I want to I want to commend you for the hard decisions that you have to be able to make. And I, I, I hope that you put our safety and the safety of our citizens um, forward and truly give residential sprinklers the due justice that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott Holstrom. Uh, Robert, or yes, Robert Glass. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Robert Glass, and I'm with uh, Goodman Manufacturing Company. Um, Thank you, Kyle, and thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the Board of Housing Community Development. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia has adopted new glo uh, low global warming potential regulations requiring the phase down of high GWP refrigerants, including R410A, which is the most common refrigerant used in human comfort air conditioning. Most of the available and effective low GWP refrigerants are classified as A2L refrigerants as listed under the 2019 edition of ASHRAE 34. Uh, and this is referenced in both the Virginia Mechanical and Residential Codes, but as the 2013 edition. The handling of these refrigerants uh, is addressed in the 2019 ASHRAE 15, uh, also referenced in the Virginia Mechanical Code, but only the 2013 edition. Uh, products need to be certified to the ULCSA 60335-2-40 2019 edition uh, in order to address the AC products utilizing these A2L refrigerants. A dash 2-40 dash is referenced in the Virginia Residential Code, but it also needs to be listed in the Virginia Mechanical Code as equivalent to the UL 1995 because the UL 1995 uh, is being withdrawn by UL effective January 1st, 2024. Uh, without simple modifications to the Virginia Residential and Mechanical Codes, it will not be possible to move to these new low GWP refrigerants in Virginia to address these climate change regulations. Uh, I'd be willing to work with the committee to address simple revisions to the Virginia Residential and Mechanical Codes 
uh, to help Virginia lead this change. Uh, Florida and Washington have already adopted these simple right. changes to their mechanical codes. Uh, so thank you for your time to consider these very important subject. Thank you. Next will be John Catlett, followed by Scott Holstrom, and then James Moss. John Catlett. Yes, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I'm John Catlett. I'm with JD Catlett Consulting LLC. Uh, I'm actually representing American Wood Council on tall wood, but uh, just on here to monitor to see if any questions came up regarding that. However, I did want to speak to the residential sprinkler change. Um, there's some comments made during, during the uh, feedback today about the two hour walls now being in existence and so on. The two hour walls have been in townhomes or ever. Uh, I won't say, you know, going back prior to building codes, but I can remember when I first got into the business as a firefighter uh, in the mid 70s, uh, we were using masonry walls that would parapet above the roof. And um, slowly but surely, as, as technology went by, that was changed and allows us to go to the gypsum board type assemblies we see today without parapeting. But uh, th that requirement has been there. Um, th there was also a statement about having to either put in an NFPA 13R or 13D system. Uh, it, the, the residential code has a section in the plumbing code of how you can sprinkle right off of the residential uh, domestic water supply. And I think that, um, be truthful with you, in my time, I've seen a, a lot of incidents uh, where a fire sprinkler system would have put out a fire. Right now, if we go to a four-story uh, townhouse, we have to have sprinkler systems in it. And even in my own experience, I moved into a townhome. This is hopefully my last home. Um, I wanted a sprinkler system in there. The option provided to me was 25 thousand dollars by the builder and when i said well maybe i'll go with it they actually said well we really don't do it 10 so, seconds i'm just going to tell you that i think it's time in virginia when i was in alexandria as a code official there uh, we got a residential sprinkler systems in a lot of buildings we typically wouldn't by allowing narrower streets and i, I think there's been a lot of success since then so thank you very much and good luck with your uh, deliberations Thank you. Scott Holstrom will be next, followed by James Mollis. Scott Holstrom. Scott Holstrom, I think maybe you were on the phone. And Kyle, you had one individual raising their hand as well. So. And Scott is trying. Okay, we'll come back to Scott Holstrom, uh, James Moss. Thank you, Kyle. And thank you, board, for allowing me this opportunity to speak. I'm James Moss president of BBCOA. I'd like to express how impressed I've been with the DHCD staff and the efforts they put forward to assist the varying committees and subcommittees during this code development process. And I'd also like to recognize the efforts of all the stakeholders. They found common ground on most of the proposals. While they often had different perspectives, they worked together to find this common ground. And to those like myself who had championed proposals that did not gain consensus, on your, on your compelling arguments to gain consensus from the stakeholders in the next code cycle. And with that, I would like to respectfully ask this board to oppose the code proposals that do not gain consensus among the respective stakeholders. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back. Scott Holstrom, are you there on the phone or in the... Is there anyone else on the phone or through the chat wishing to offer comment today? Uh, 
Mr. Holstrom, I, I think if you can turn up your volume. Can... Kyle, in the interim, I think Mr. Richard Witt has raised his hand. I don't know if he wants to. Uh, speak. Mr. Witt, did you have comments to offer? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Witt, we can hear you. If you could go ahead and proceed. Uh, sorry. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, my name is Richard Witt, and uh, the first thing I'd like to do is thank the board for all their effort. As a former member, I know what you had to go through, and it was a lot to digest. Also, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the HCD staff, because they, they have just done a yeoman's job throughout the process, putting together numbers of work groups as well as some work groups to discuss all the code issues. I would, though, like to urge you to uh, push the sprinkler issue to the next code cycle and establish the, the staff can establish a sub work group with all the stakeholders to discuss this issue. I was present years ago when this issue first came up with the proposal to install sprinklers. Quite frankly, it's kind of night and day difference between then and now. At that time, there was a proposal for all or nothing with no really uh, significant uh, compromise. So and it was two sides against each other. Um, but I think uh, this day and time, there is, there is room for compromise, and I see a potential for a better code change to come in the next code cycle. Having worked through the entire fire code in the last three to five years, uh, I think the tenor between all groups has changed. So I would just uh, urge this the board to go ahead and move this issue to the next code cycle where it will be fully vetted. And I will tell you, I was at the work group meeting when it came up. This would have been completely for disapproval uh, from the work group, except for a couple people raised their hands and, and objected to that. So that kind of gives you a sense of where the work group was. So, uh, thank you a whole lot for allowing me to comment, and I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witt. Okay. Uh, Scott Holstrom. Mr. Holstrom. It looks like Mr. Um, Holstrom is offered, or opted to not offer comments, and that, that is everyone who has uh, signed up um, at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Kyle. With that, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn temporarily take a five minute break and then come back for the subcommittee meetings before we come back to the main meeting. Can I get a motion from a board member to that effect? 
This Keith motion to adjourn for five minutes. Thank you. Second, Ab Johnson. Okay, uh, Kyle, can we do a voice vote on this since it's not? Uh, I, think that, I think that's okay. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> all right, looks like the ayes have a five minute break and then we'll come back, start with the subcommittees and then come back to the main board meeting. Thank you guys.
So at least I guess it's way to keep doing it. All right, guys, I'm going to uh, reconvene the Board of Housing Community Development meeting. Um, Kyle, would you like to call roll again just to make sure that we have the members back and have maintained our quorum? For the, for, for, for the actual, um, actually, we're going to start with the subcommittee, right? So you can call for the subcommittee. Correct for the statewide fire prevention uh, code development committee. So. Um, um, for that committee, uh, Mr. Mr. Little. Mr. Little. Kyle, he is on the call. He might be having some mic trouble, so I'll reach out to him. Mr. Garber. Right. Try one more time, Mr. Garber is present. Thank you, sir.